lecture for tonight is on preserving the Word of God, uh, the, the work of the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, or CSNTM. And I wanted to begin by answering the question, what is CSNTM? It's a nonprofit institute with 501c3 status. That means that you can give money to it and get a tax deduction. Just wanted to make sure you knew that. Uh, founded in September of 2002. It's dedicated to digitally photographing all handwritten manuscripts of the New Testament. And to use these manuscripts to get back to the original wording of the New Testament as much as is humanly possible. That kind of gives you a broad view of what CSNTM is about. Well, how many manuscripts are we talking about? As of September 2012, the number is officially 5,800 and 24, and that's what uh, the Institute for Neu Testament with the Text for Schung and Munster has counted uh, because of 11 manuscripts. Oops. We're okay. You don't need to get up, or you can still sit and relax. Um, uh, that uh, they uh, counted 11 manuscripts that we had discovered earlier, and we constantly are working with INTF to tell them about the kinds of manuscripts we're discovering. They'll see the images. They have to go through a rigorous process to make sure these manuscripts are not parts of other manuscripts, because in the past there have been many times in which a new manuscript has been discovered and it was really a part of another one, but it gets an official different number. And that's why, one of the reasons at least, why we have about 200 fewer manuscripts actually than what we have officially. Because we have a number of manuscripts that are parts of others, like P64 and P67 are parts of the same manuscript. We photographed some lectionary leaves in Texas, that uh, just four lectionary leaves that we thought were of, of uh, a manuscript that uh, the rest of it had, had gone away. And when we posted the image was online, there was a fellow in North Carolina who went to Duke University, and he said, these leaves are the missing leaves of lectionary 1967. So we're virtually reuniting some of these manuscripts by some of the work we're doing as well. And there's other reasons why we have about 200 fewer than that, but it's still a pretty impressive number. But there's also several that have not yet been counted by INTF uh, that we have uh, discovered and photographed, and some of them we haven't even posted online. There's a number of manuscripts in the next six or eight weeks that will be going online, the images um, from uh, several of our recent uh, expeditions, so be looking for that. Well, in our first 10 years of existence, we took more than uh, 200,000 photographs of uh, over 400 Greek New Testament manuscripts. And we have been collaborating with INTF and several other institutes as well. And our credibility has grown. We really wanted to start this as a small institute because there were others that were, were doing something similar, not really with New Testament manuscripts so much, although there was one institute that did that. They decided, they made an official announcement that they are going to go to Mount Athos, this peninsula that's 30 or 40 kilometers long in, in northeastern Greece. It's got 22 monasteries, and they were going to digitize all the manuscripts on Mount Athos. Well, in these 22 monasteries, they have actually about 22,000 manuscripts, almost exactly 1,000 of which, at least those that are known, are New Testament manuscripts. So what this institute wanted to do was digitize all the manuscripts. And uh, that way they could get uh, out of that the 5% that they were really interested in, the New Testament manuscripts. The problem is they didn't tell the folks at Mount Athos, the monks and priests, and they were raising money and talking about this, and all of a sudden um, they heard from them and they said, you know, you have to incorporate us in these discussions. You are not coming. And so the money that had been raised was diverted to uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, unfortunately for a New Testament person like, like me, unfortunately. But nevertheless... Um, We've tried to build our reputation very, very slowly and very carefully, and we never presume, and we uh, try especially hard not to act like ugly Americans when we go to these various countries. Uh, we actually have a manual that uh, everybody who goes on these expeditions with us has to read, and part of it has to do with uh, cultural assimilation and learning to get along with people of different cultures and not uh, uh, coming off arrogantly or as if we're some kind of special people. Well, because of the images that we have been providing now to the INTF, which really is kind of the command center for the critical Greek New Testaments that have been published, uh, CSNTM has begun to stand at the head of the stream of 
all future published translations or most future published translations of the New Testament by way of getting these images to INTF. And this affects the faith and practice of Christians throughout the world. The most recent edition of the INTF is the Nestle All-In 28th edition. And this just, uh, it came out in November. And a number of the images that we have been supplying them for the last few years have helped them to read manuscripts that were unreadable in parts earlier. I'll show you an illustration to that uh, as, we, as we work through this. But it's, it's, it's amazing and exciting to think this tiny institute, CSNTM, that's got three employees right now. Uh, as of Monday, it will have a fourth. Two of them will be full-time. I'm not employed there. I'm just the director. I get to be the boss, but I don't get paid. So um, this is a, an, an exciting thing for us to have this kind of an impact. A few weeks ago, one of our uh, fellows, the uh, research manager for CSNTM, went to a digital networking conference in Paris. And we were invited because they, were, they wanted to invite all the major institutes that were doing digital networking in Paris. Here we go. Rory, did you do this too? Can I blame you? No, all right. Uh, now I need your help, I think, probably if you can, if you can come up here to just keep it going. Maybe it's, you think I should just, uh, I'll go without you, all right. You don't look like you want to move. That's fine, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work. So, here our research manager, Rob Marcello, went to uh, Paris a few weeks ago and met with these other folks from uh, various institutes, and they all knew who CSNTM was. Now, what's interesting is that we had people there from the British Library, from the Vatican, from the Bibliothèque Nationale, uh, very, very important institutes, but they all recognized CSNTM and they wanted to find out the kind of work that we're doing and how we got into various libraries and things like this. So it's, it's exciting work, and it's also painful work. I've already had three, three major surgeries from the expeditions we've been in, but um, uh, it's important, and so we continue to do this work. In the beginning, there was microfilm, and it was not good. <laughs> Here's the kind of thing I'm talking about. This is one of the latest microfilms that was produced in Munster, uh, done in 1989, I believe, was when this one was, these uh, photographs were taken. And the positive image was harder to read than the negative, so this is what they had to produce to make it more readable. You know, it's no more readable on my screen than it is there. It's just a bunch of bumps and lines. But every once in a while, you can make out a word and make out maybe the next letter. Uh, and consequently, you can say, oh, I think this might be here. And you find it in your New Testament, and then you can collate this thing. This is how manuscripts have been collated in Munster for decades by looking at these uh, very poor quality microfilms, but microfilms nonetheless. The Institute of Munster has over 90% of all Greek New Testament manuscripts photographed, and the vast majority of those are on microfilm. This is the quality of images that they've had to work with, or worse. And they've asked the uh, collators, the students that have to essentially transcribe all the data so we know exactly what each manuscript says, they've had to ask them to ignore the marginal notes. The microfilms cannot read gold text or, or, or red text, uh, can't reproduce it. So uh, they're really impoverished in a number of things. They can't tell if there's an erasure. You, can't, you can hardly tell what's on the page, uh, let alone whether there's erasures here. So digital photography came along, and we had a little bit better quality. This is digital. No, this is not digital yet. This is another microfilm. Uh, INTF either produced their own microfilms by photographing these manuscripts throughout the world, or they purchased them. This was a purchased one of a, a, a fairly important Pauline manuscript. And they contacted me a few years ago when I was at a colloquium in Munster for Textual Critics. And they said, have you had a chance to take photographs of this particular manuscript? And I said, oh yes, we we've, we've photographed that. Well, is it possible that we could get those images? And we uh, uh, worked out some negotiations so they could get the images. This is what they've had to rely on for a long time. In fact, I was told that once they converted these microfilm images into the digital product that you're seeing in front of you, it actually became easier to read than what they had on microfilm. Well, here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the two, or I'll show it to you in a second. So then came digital photography, and it was very good. And here we see this comparison. 
This is the same page. Now, if you were up here close, you could say, oh, I can read that easily. It's, it's, it's really a huge difference. This is Romans chapter 1 in uh, this particular manuscript, Codex 1175. Exactly the same page, and yet the difference between the microfilm is that you, you, you can't read it. You know there's words there, and if you look really, really closely and really hard, you might even guess that they're written in the Greek alphabet. But uh, then you look at the other page, and it's, uh, it's, it's really quite stunning. Here's a photograph of a manuscript that we discovered in Yash, Romania, just a few years ago. It's an 800-page lectionary from the 11th century. It's an absolutely magnificent manuscript, very, very large, one of the biggest manuscripts I've ever seen. We photographed it in one day because we, we have a very special kind of equipment that can do this and make nice, blocked, beautiful images. But uh, here's a manuscript that we discovered. It now has a Gregory Allen number. Uh, and you can see there's a little bit of a difference between seeing something like this versus those bleached out microfilms. You can also see the color, and the color becomes a, a extremely important in a number of ways. Uh, for example, you can tell how the, uh, uh, with the, the, the musical notations were with the uh, red ink. You can see a number of different issues in terms of the punctuation. Was this done by the original scribe or not? There are some different ways you can think about those issues. And so color is actually part of an interpretive tool for reading these manuscripts that simply was not possible when you started with um, uh, the microfilm to begin with. Well, moving from the sublime to the ridiculous, we get to this manuscript. Although the hand is very nice, it's an 11th century manuscript of the Book of Acts, look at the upper right-hand corner, and you see there chicken scratches, which are the Greek alphabet written in a child's hand. Uh, and I I you know this is a young child, four, five, maybe six years old, because uh, it starts with a cross, ends with three crosses, good Orthodox child, and it has a lowercase alpha, then a capital beta, capital gamma, lowercase delta, etc. It goes back and forth, as children do. They don't make the distinction between the upper and lower case as well, and so when they're just learning, they they'll switch back and forth. Well, you can see what happened in the lower right-hand corner as well. And I suggest that something like this may have occurred. We have this medieval monk who is writing out this text, and it was invite an obscure relative to the monastery day. And so he had his second cousin three times removed come and visit him, a little five-year-old boy. And while the monk is taking a cigarette break, the, the kid gets in there and just kind of uh, carves up the manuscript, and he drew back a bloody stump. So. At least that's my unsanctified imagination as to what might have happened. But uh, you do have this kind of thing in the manuscripts. You see an awful lot of humanity in these manuscripts. I, I've been absolutely fascinated by the fact of being able to handle hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts and examine them and uh, give a detailed analysis of them for the photographers. But one of the things that's interesting is I typically see the Greek alphabet written out in a manuscript once and only once. And that's because once the scribe discovers that he had allowed his manuscript into the uh, uh, realm of a child, he learns his own mistakes and never lets it happen again. Are these manuscripts well cared for? Some of them are, some of them are not. In a number of European libraries, well-known libraries, the manuscripts are simply not cared for well at all. I've spoken to some librarians at major university libraries in Western Europe, and they have told me that they have zero budget, and by that they mean not even enough for a janitor to sweep the floors in some of their old manuscript libraries. They have a research library and an old manuscript library, so they have to sweep the floors themselves. Nobody goes in there, but uh, they have no budget for it. So these are major institutes that are the ones who are the keepers of these manuscripts. I've been in other places where I've been in in monasteries on islands where there's one priest and one assistant. How would you like to be number two in that job? All he's doing is helping this priest and they go through their, their worship services daily and uh, they get visitors every once in a while. So we, we came and visited. There were two manuscripts that we knew of at this particular uh, uh, very tiny monastery. And they took us out to this shed that was uh, cinder block and a corrugated, uh, uh, what is it, corrugated aluminum, kind of a roof, with an old lock that looked at it as though it had not been touched for a long, long time. 
The priest opened it up. It had a dirt floor. And on this shelf, besides all the dirt and the dust, were several manuscripts, two of which were New Testament manuscripts. And we had wanted to come and photograph these, knowing that uh, they were uh, probably out of the way, had never been even microfilmed, and we wanted to get them digitized so, so we can constantly preserve Scripture for, for scholarly and religious purposes. I opened up the first manuscript, and as I opened it up, pulled the cover open, bits of paper just flew out everywhere. The thing was already destroyed. It would be impossible to photograph it. If I had slammed the covers uh, hard, it would have just all turned to dust. It was, it was deteriorated beyond repair, and it was impossible to get it photographed. This is the kind of thing that we see way too often. We learn of libraries that have burned to the ground. There was one at a famous monastery just a few years ago, in the last 10 years, where the library um, lost every single one of its holdings, and none of them had been microfilmed. At the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale they took a, in, in Paris, they took a, a, a catalog, an inventory of uh, the manuscripts and books that they had just a few years ago, and since they had done the last cataloging, they had discovered that 30,000 of them had gone missing uh, several, several years before. So even in some great libraries, where they do take care of the manuscripts well, a lot of these things get lost. When we were in Constantinople, which uh, you know probably is Istanbul, but uh, really the Greeks prefer it to be called Constantinople, we were at the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate, or the Eastern Orthodox Patriarchate of Constantinople, which is effectively the same as the Vatican, except for the Orthodox world. And they had a number of manuscripts uh, that we uh, were uh, privileged to photograph. Well, a few years later, we were at the University of Michigan, and we discovered that the University of Michigan had quite a few manuscripts that had come from Constantinople. And how they came from Constantinople, we don't know. But I was able to put some things together, and it seemed as if what had happened was in the 1920s or so, uh, some people uh, came to Constantinople and bought these manuscripts from some unsavory folks who had access to them, but they were not uh, part of the uh, um, Patriarchate, and they ended up at the University of Michigan. Well, I told this to the University of Michigan librarians, and they said, yeah, that's probably how we got them. So, okay, uh, that's, that's, uh, sometimes they're, they're, they're cared for, sometimes they're sold, sometimes they're sold on the black market or gray market, and sometimes they are exquisitely cared for. At the monastery of St. John the Theologian on the island of Patmos, the library was de designed by a fellow named John Sharp, or at least he had a big hand in designing it. He was a codicologist at Duke University, and what they did with this library it's a subterranean library. So even though it's hot in Greece, this place happened to be uh, a little bit on the cool side, which was uh, perfect. And they actually have holes behind the books in the bookshelves where air conditioning comes out. So it's air conditioned on all sides. It's, it's absolutely stunning how they, they care for these things. And uh, in, in some of these libraries, they have special boxes for each one of the manuscripts that they put them in. Others, even well-known ones in American, they don't care for them at all. So it's, it's, it's just kind of amazing what you get, and uh, we're not sure what we're going to get at any one place. You can tell if a manuscript is parchment, if it's been rat-eaten, if it's made of paper, it will be eaten by worms. And so this is a parchment manuscript that uh, about a third of it no longer is uh, readable because it's in some rat's stomach someplace. Uh, and some of these old libraries, they don't have the kinds of things that we have now in new buildings that keep all the vermin out. In fact, one of the basic problems you have when you discover new manuscripts, like the ones of the new finds in uh, St. Catherine's Monastery, is that there's a, a lot of insect uh, droppings that you have to deal with. and so. One of two ways uh, there are in which to handle these manuscripts, some would say you, you handle them by using uh, cotton gloves, and that's a, that's a good way to do it. The problem with it is that sometimes the gloves get stuck on the pages as you turn in it, and it could rip the pages. More and more places are turning to say, we want you to handle them with your bare hands, but always make sure your hands are clean. 
And so at the University of Michigan, when we photographed all of their uh, New Testament manuscripts, uh, we were told, we want you to uh, have bare hands. Well, if you have bare hands when you're dealing with manuscripts that have been in a Geniza for 200 years and there's a lot of animal droppings on them, then you're dealing with some diseases that could, you're getting exposed to. So you've got to make sure to you know, clean your hands afterwards and things like this. It's, it's a, uh, sometimes it's a bit of a difficult environment. Well, some of the sites we've visited, and I wanted to tell you about uh, each one of these just a little bit. I've already mentioned the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople, uh, a magnificent site, and uh, they have a, a curious way of numbering their manuscripts. Now, I've seen this in more than one place, not just uh, here, but it seems that when they have a manuscript that goes missing, then the next manuscript in line gets that catalog number, and the manuscripts are numbered just in sequence, so they have approximately 300 manuscripts at the uh, Patriarchate. And so if you're missing uh, manuscript number 67, well then what was number 68 now gets 68, 67. So there's no gaps. Well that's helpful if you want no gaps, but it's not real helpful if you want to find out what you've got in the manuscript. And we had a hundred year old catalog to work from. And so we'd ask uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, servants to bring out some manuscripts to us and we'd say, okay, we want this manuscript. It looks like it's a, a biblical manuscript. So they'd bring this thing out, and it would be the wrong size, the wrong number of leaves, completely wrong manuscript. And so they'd have to go back two or three times sometimes to find it. We'd have to guess because we were not allowed in the library until the last day. So one of these manuscripts that they brought out was one that was completely wrong. It was an in, in, inside kind of a journal done by a monk in about the 14th or 15th century. And when we got to the last two leaves, what we discovered was this thing was a palimpsest the last two leaves of the manuscript were. That's a manuscript that's been scraped over and reused again in later centuries. And what was written on those last two leaves was majuscule script from Mark chapter three on one of them and Mark chapter six on the other. This was the first majuscule manuscript discovered in Constantinople. We discovered two others on that expedition as well that were not biblical but uh, patristic. And it was a huge discovery, very exciting to us. The manuscript is now numbered as 0322 by the Institute in Munster, and we still can't read very much of it because the uh, scribe did a pretty thorough job of scraping off that undertext, but we can read some of it. We know that it's from Mark 3 and Mark, uh, Mark 6. We've been to the monastery of St. John the Theologian on Patmos four times. This is just flat out one of my favorite places in the world to be, uh, not just the monastery, but Patmos itself. There's about 3,000 people who live there during the summers. And in order to get to Patmos, you have to take a ferry from Athens. Now, a, a ferry in Greece is not like uh, what I grew up with in Newport Beach, California. It could hold four cars and go across the bay. These ferries can hold something like 20 Mack trucks that can do full U-turns inside the, inside the ferry. They're huge things. And it takes eight hours from Athens to get to Patmos, stopping at one or two islands en route. So it usually leaves at midnight, gets to uh, Patmos the next morning at about 8 o'clock. And uh, we've been there so often that the people in town have begun to recognize us. We've eaten at a number of the restaurants, and of all the people who live on Patmos during the summer, we've only met four who were not particularly friendly, and two of them were Australians, so I'm not sure what that says, but, but uh, great place, wonderful, uh, wonderful, wonderful place to visit. And we've discovered uh, one or two manuscripts there at the... Uh, uh, Monastery of St. John the Theologian as well. In 2007, we went to the National Archives of Chirana, Albania. In 1945, Albania became a communist country, and Westerners were not really invited in, allowed in for quite some time. And uh, we got a tip on some manuscripts that might be there, and we discovered that not very many of the manuscripts they had had ever been microfilmed. So we wrote to the National Archives and asked if we could come and photograph the manuscripts, and they said yes. And in the letter I wrote to them, I said, my understanding is you have 13 manuscripts here in the uh, uh, National Archives building. And uh, the uh, director wrote back and said, yes, uh, your information is correct. When we got there the first day, we looked at uh, an in-house catalog that was typed, looked like in the 60s, all in Albanian, and it revealed that they had far more than 13 New Testament manuscripts they had closer to 45. And apparently some of them had come from monasteries 
where they had uh, been prior to the communist era. We'll talk about one of these manuscripts in just a minute. And there were uh, uh, several new ones, uh, something in the neighborhood of uh, 25 to 30 manuscripts that uh, were uh, unknown prior to uh, uh, this trip. And so those manuscripts are in the process of being given Gregory Allon numbers. And this made international news. About 100 newspapers throughout the world carried the story. One time when I was in Athens, several months later, I got a call from the Wall Street Journal on my cell phone, and they interviewed me during that uh, uh, call. So that was a, a bit of an expensive uh, phone bill. Cell phones that are not ready for international calls from uh, America can be a little bit expensive when it goes on for 45 minutes. But this was a great place, and we are grateful to have been part of uh, preserving the collection. The University of Michigan in Ann Arbor has the largest collection of Greek New Testament manuscripts in North America. And that's because they started in the early 20th century of collecting these manuscripts and trying to make this a, a major research institute. I think they have 56 New Testament manuscripts. And except for the papyri, we photographed all the ones they had, the papyri had already been done. Cambridge University, we photographed manuscripts at several of the colleges there and discovered uh, one or two manuscripts uh, in route. Just an amazing place. We were in the UK for 10 weeks in 2008, uh, spending uh, most of our time in Cambridge, then we went to Oxford, uh, Edinburgh, Glasgow, uh, St. Andrews, and other places. The Bayarische Staatsbibliothek in Munich is another uh, world famous uh, library, or the Bavarian State Library in Munich. They have the largest collection of what's known as Incunabula in Europe. Incunabula are books that were printed on a printing press before the year 1500. Well, Gutenberg invented the printing press in 1454. So to have it printed before 1500 means you've got just a 46 year window of getting these printed books done. There are known to be 30,000 titles of these Incunabula. And the Bavarian State Library has the largest collection in Europe and probably in the world. They have 18,000 of those titles. Uh, to get an incunabulan is kind of a dream of bibliophiles. I own one incunabulan. I, I'm speaking theoretically. I, that was not a quote from me. I, I'd like to own one, but just to get even one that uh, really is, is hardly relevant for anything would cost two or $300 to get a small one. I've got one that's close to an incunabulan that cost me almost that much. But at the uh, Bavarian State Library, we photographed some manuscripts and then I prepped manuscripts. I came back the next summer and prepared manuscripts for photography for them later on. And one of the interesting things uh, that I noticed there was this. As I was looking at those manuscripts the next summer and preparing them to be photographed, 38 manuscripts they had, I, I looked at one that was known as Gregory Allen number 177. The lower the number, the earlier it had actually been cataloged and became known to Western scholars. This was a manuscript that was known for 150, 200 years, something like that. So it was a well-known manuscript. And when I got to 1 John chapter 5, I noticed in the top margin that the comma Johannium, or the Trinitarian formula that we get in the King James Bible, was written out. Now, we have uh, where it says uh, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, these three are one. Uh, or these are the ones who bear witness in heaven, these three are one. And we know of four manuscripts, and only four, that have the Greek text of the comma in, in the actual text. We knew of four manuscripts that had it in the margins. All of these are late. All of them are second millennium manuscripts. There's very few people today who think that uh, the comma is authentic as much as we would like it to be. But here was a manuscript that was numbered 177, and apparently it had been forgotten that it also had the comma. And so I was amazed that these manuscripts that have been, some of them have been microfilmed and only microfilmed, some of them have not been uh, photographed in any capacity at all, may have some fascinating treasures in them that simply need someone to examine to, to find out what's there. The Museum of Literature in Yash, Romania, I'll show you a little bit about the path to get to Yash, but that's where we photographed that one manuscript that I showed you pictures of earlier, uh, an 11th century lectionary. And uh, just a, it was a delightful time in Yash and a very difficult time to get there. A year and a half ago, we were in the Biblioteca Lorenziana, Medicia Lorenziana in Florence. 
where I twisted my knee and had to fly home early to uh, uh, have some surgery. Oops. Apparently the computer needs some surgery too. And uh, this was a, a magnificent place, absolutely incredible to be there. You need to take it this. help me a bit. Now it's your fault, my friend. <coughs> this library is the only library in the world that Michelangelo designed. And it is a, a fabulous library with uh, uh, some of the holdings that the Medici family was able to purchase. The Medicis were uh, the most influential family behind the Renaissance uh, in Europe. And it's, it's an incredible place. While we were photographing there, we, um, th there was a, a, an incident that happened right outside the library. Somebody came and he was a racist with a gun, and he started shooting people from a different country. He killed, I think, three people, and the police caught him in a garage just 50 yards away from the, the library and, and killed him. He could have run into the library, so it could have been a little bit of a risky situation for us there. Uh, but uh, this is the kind of thing we, we get, even in a place like Florence, which really doesn't have that kind of crime, except unusually. Maybe we just draw it because we're Americans and we bring that wherever we go. But... Uh, it's amazing the kinds of places that we get into that have this kind of situation. Albania is a country that is very poor, and it has, um, during the summer times, the government shuts down the electricity uh, in kind of a, a roving brownout uh, throughout the country in all buildings. And here we were in the National Archives in Albania, and they don't tell you when you're going to get the, the electricity shut off, but it would take about until 10 a.m. before the air conditioning started to finally work and, and we could uh, feel cool. And then it would shut off sometime within the next hour or so for about four hours. Well, the temperature would get up to about 100 degrees and uh, we couldn't open the windows. They were uh, nailed shut. So we had to keep working in those kinds of conditions. And so what we do is we bring plenty of backup batteries both for computers and for cameras. And that's why we're taking... 16 large pieces of luggage on every one of these expeditions for four people. But we have to keep working, and sometimes the conditions are simply uh, not the best, but um, uh, the, the photography, I think, and, and what we're able to see in these manuscripts is, is pretty significant. Here's one of the manuscripts we photographed in Albania. This is actually uh, on the UNESCO World Treasure List as uh, a national treasure for the country. This is a 6th century Gospels manuscript that is a purple codex. We only know of about half a dozen such manuscripts in the world, all of them Gospels manuscripts, where the scribes would take this uh, parchment and dye it in purple. And then they figured out a way to turn silver and gold actually into ink so it would be a liquid that would then dry on the parchment. And all the words on this manuscript are in silver, except for four words, God, Lord, Jesus, and Christ. Those are in gold. And I'll let you think through why the scribes would put those particular words in gold. They happen to be the four earliest nomina sacra. You see the little carrots in the left margin of the second column on the, uh, at the bottom half? That's indicating a quotation from the Old Testament. It's always a way in which they would highlight that they're dealing with authoritative scripture. Now, this particular manuscript is not in great shape. Uh, the edges are frayed. It's, uh, it's been beaten up pretty badly. It is from the 6th century. Well, that's that's uh, you know, going for it in that sense. But the reason it's so frayed and in bad shape is because of what happened in World War II and beyond. Hitler found out about this particular manuscript, and he sent some soldiers to uh, the mountains of Barat, where this manuscript was held at the, uh, um, you know, the, the monastery there. It's known as Codex Beratinus. And these Nazi soldiers lined up the monks and the old people, or the old men of the village, and uh, said, tell us where this manuscript is, or you will die. 
And so they asked the first person. And he said, I don't know. There was a pause. Then they asked the second person. I don't know. Right on down the line. Then there was a very long pause. And they said, all right, we believe you. And they left. Kind of a grade B miracle. Uh, a few days later, the abbot of the monastery came back, and there was a long line outside of his office of monks and old men confessing their sins for having lied about the location of this manuscript. The manuscript was hidden behind the uh, service tables in the sanctuary under a rock in a very mildewed area, and it was kept there even into the communist era. And so that's, that explains the uh, shape that it's in. But I find it fascinating. These men, uh, except for the monks, the old men of the village, didn't know Greek. But they were willing to die for this manuscript because it was a copy of the Word of God. Patmos, as I've said, is one of the great places we visited. There's a fortress monastery on the, uh, the hill at the top of Patmos. And uh, this is uh, almost 1,000 years old. Uh, when we go to monasteries like this, what we typically do is we wear uh, black from head to toe. And uh, we'll wear long sleeve black shirts and black backpacks and black pants and black shoes. And they've asked us, why, why do you do this? We say, we wish to honor the monastery. And so uh, a lot of them have really warmed up to that and realized, yeah, we really are trying to, to respect their traditions and honor their traditions. Some places you go to will not allow you in unless you're wearing a long sleeve shirt. Others say a short sleeve shirt is fine, but if you don't cover your shoulders, ladies, it's right out. You'll not be allowed to go in. Uh, so there's a number of different rules. We just decided to go with the strictest rule possible and use that on ourselves, and they learned to respect us and appreciate that. So we eat with these monks and priests in this dining room that's about 900 years old on these long stone tables. There's murals in the dining room of the great creeds of the faith and events in the Gospels. And uh, just to be able to eat there with them is, is uh, quite an amazing feat. They have wine set out for lunch at, uh, every, every day. And on Wednesdays and Fridays are fast days in the Orthodox world. And so on those two days, they don't allow themselves to drink wine or have dairy products or dessert. And so here it was on a Wednesday... And the abbot had the custom of about 20, 25 minutes into the meal, he would chime a little bell and then stand up and pray, and all of us would exit. That meant the, the, the uh, noon meal was over. Well, here, it was just a few minutes. I'm sorry, on Wednesday, he, he uh, uh, did the same thing. But the wine was in front of us, but nobody poured it. The priests and monks did not pour it. And I told the guys with us, I said, look, let's follow their traditions. We don't want to cause any offense. And so... I think they uh, set that out just for those who really were not Orthodox and didn't care about their traditions, but we followed them very carefully. Then on Friday, another fast day, we were there, and the same kind of thing happened, but this is the time that the, the abbot actually chimed the bell about 10 to 15 minutes into the meal. And I thought, boy, he's really uh, getting us out of here quick today. What he was actually doing was saying the fast is now over, and so all the priests started pouring the wine, and they could uh, do the rest of what you do when the fast is over. So it was uh, a double uh, chiming day, I guess, is, is uh, what you have. Uh, fascinating time. But because we respected his traditions and showed him that uh, we honored what he was doing, he told us, you men would make great priests. And I said, I'm already married. So I dodged that bullet, I guess, but... Actually, the Orthodox can be married and be priests, but if they are, they don't go to a monastery, they go to a church. But it's a great, great site, uh, Patmos is. Romania. Romania has a road, the national highway, that looks like this. And there are horse-drawn carts that are on the national highway. And then there's another road that gets to Yash, I-A-S-I, -I, Yash, the second largest city in Romania. It's about 35 kilometers long, and it looks like this the whole way. It looks like it had been bombed out in World War II and never repaired. Sometimes you will see five-foot potholes on this road, the DN-24. Just in case you missed it, this is the pothole I'm talking about. 
and you could see that little bird standing over it. Just before we got to it, we saw a little Toyota Sentra that, that went over the pothole and it went into the thing and never came out. So we knew it was a little bit dangerous. It was absolutely impossible to avoid the potholes on this road for 35 kilometers. Our, our kidneys were hurting pretty badly when we got to Yash. We asked, how do you get out of this town? Surely there's another road besides this. They said, no, that's, that's the road you take. Is there an airport? No, we don't have an airport. And so we, we got the answer that either this is the road you take or they've heard of another way to get out of town, but nobody could verify it. So this is the route we had to take when we got out. By the time we got on the other national highway that was at least uh, better paved, within just two or three miles, what happened was the rear bumper on our brand new Avis SUV fell off. Uh, it couldn't handle the, the potholes too much either. It's just a, an incredible time. But you saw that, that one lectionary, that's that 800-page lectionary that we discovered and photographed. It's magnificent to have that kind of quality of images in remote places like this. St. Catherine's Monastery, which I introduced you to this morning, talked about the New Finds manuscripts and Tischendorf's visits and this sort of thing. Just a, a, an incredible place, but I'm going to just give you a couple other images here. Here I am with Father Justin inside the library, and you notice the magic that Photoshop could do. I can elongate the image so I look a lot thinner. Um, he actually does look that thin, but uh, nevertheless, it was, this was uh, uh, 10 years ago. And uh, the library, it's not a, an exciting looking place. It's all the metal structures, but it keeps everything in exactly the way it's supposed to be kept. They have 15% humidity year round, which is marvelous for these manuscripts. They just don't get so humid that they, they get worn out. And they, don't, they don't molder as uh, Tischendorf suggested that they did. And the library is really capable of handling any kind of a disaster like a fire. You see this little uh, red thing up here? That's a halon tube. You may have seen the halon tubes. They're not quite like this in Terminator 2 when Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Connors are coming out of this building and all the police are shooting at them. And he gives masks to the mother and, and, and son because the halon tubes are sucking all the oxygen out of the room. And uh, so what they have in the library and what they have in the chapel of the burning bush are halon tubes so that if there is anything living in there when a fire happens, they will not be living much longer. And here's uh, uh, the other halon tubes. So they are making a sacrifice of themselves to make sure these books are protected. That's a little different than having a sprinkler system, isn't it? I kind of like to have a halon tube in some of uh, the parts of Dallas Seminary's library. Maybe because there's certain students that study there, I'm not sure. But anyway. Athens has always been an adventure for us, and we, we go there every year now. In the last three years, it has looked something like this when we've been there. This is 2010, the summer of 2010, and two out of the last three years, we were there in the middle of the riots. The riots take place in the museum district, which is where the manuscripts are housed. And we would take a taxi to get to uh, the museum, whichever one we were photographing at, and uh, we'd have to take a different route because the road would be blocked off by the police. So this is what Athens is like. Uh, a year and a half ago when I was there, I was examining some manuscripts at the National Library of Athens, and when we got all done, uh, they told us we can't go out the front door, we have to go out the back door because the communists got a little bit too frisky that day, and so they had uh, tear gas everywhere. And so we had to go out the back door. And of course, my curiosity got the better of me, and so immediately I did a 180 and walked down towards the tear gas. And that was quite an adventure. Um, so I could say I've walked into tear gas. I, I hope I can say that only once. Now our priorities in photographing manuscripts are to go to places that are poor or politically unstable sites. That's because these manuscripts are at risk and we want to get to them before they get uh, destroyed. We have contacted countries that are in the midst of civil wars to see if we can photograph their manuscripts. And uh, we are hoping to get into Syria uh, one of these days soon, but they're in, a, in uh, the midst of some terrible uh, civil war. There's 20 important manuscripts in Damascus, and uh, we have some contacts, but it'll take a little while before we can get in there. We try to go where we have leads on uncatalogued manuscripts, manuscripts that Western scholars do not know about. We try to go where manuscripts are known to be significant, or the libraries are known to be significant, and ultimately, we try to get every single Greek New Testament manuscript photographed. 
whether we do it ourselves or whether somebody else does it. But we want to have all of these digitized and available on the internet. We also use UV photography that helps us a great deal with water damaged manuscripts and with palimpsests. Here's a manuscript, this is 2464, and it's a manuscript that has water damage for about 50 leaves. And you can see the top four or five lines on the right, you, there, it's, it's all washed out, you can't uh, read it at all. Well, we haven't been able to read that for centuries, apparently. We photograph this with our regular cameras that cost $8,000 a piece. That does not include the lenses, and we still couldn't read it any better than what it had before. Then we used a UV lamp, and look at what happened when we added that to the whole thing. Now, it's kind of hard to see from where you're at, but what we can now do is read the entire manuscript. And so these 50 or so leaves that are water damaged, uh, one of the students who was with me helping to photograph the manuscripts actually wrote his master's thesis on this manuscript and published a collation or a transcription of the entire text so that we've got this whole thing now after hundreds of years, now it's available to scholars uh, to examine again. So those are some of the exciting things we do. Now in the last uh, two or three years, we have begun to use the Graz Travelers Conservation Copy Stand. This is a contraption that's made in Graz, Austria by a manuscript scholar who has basically revolutionized how manuscripts are being photographed in the German-speaking world. Uh, it's a, a, a machine that holds the manuscript open to 105 degrees, no wider than 105 degrees, and the, the camera rolls up and down and you can get it closer and uh, different things. You've got lasers that help to get it in focus and all sorts of bells and whistles uh, that make this thing cost over $12,000. Uh, uh, the site has the list of all the places in the world that has one of these, and as far as I know, all the places in the world that have one have only one. CSNTM has two, and our third one is gonna be delivered probably in the next month or so. Uh, it has helped us in the costs of the photography from $6 a page down to $4 a page. It's helped us to move that much faster, and so it's, it usually pays for itself in uh, two expeditions of three or four weeks apiece. Uh, but it's a remarkable tool that is making our pictures much more squared and we can get, it, get them done faster. It packs up in its own suitcase. It weighs just under 50 pounds. And here it is in operation with uh, one of our cameras as well. Now, just to give you a taste of what's happened in the last few years, the last couple of years, uh, here's what we are aiming at right now, is, is we're coming to the conviction that more manuscripts need to be discovered to fill in the gaps. Approximately 20% of all the manuscripts that we've photographed are manuscripts that we are discovering. I should say a word as to what I mean by discover. I don't necessarily mean that that library does not know what they have. That may be the case in, in some instances, but normally those libraries do know what they have. But to discover it, and you could put it in quotes, what it really means is to make the information known to Munster and to provide images to Munster so that they can then give a catalog number on it and New Testament scholars can know about these manuscripts. That's what it means. There are times where we have discovered manuscripts, though, that are genuine discoveries, especially palimpsests, where it's typically leaves that are used for book binding, and uh, they are cannibalized from an older manuscript and then glued in to the cover in the front uh, section of the book so that it can keep the, uh, the pages in, in line with the, uh, uh, the cover. We have found a number of manuscripts that way. Uh, we found some that are palimpsested leaves, and we see that especially while we're going through and preparing the manuscript for photography. Just to prepare each manuscript to be photographed takes two to sometimes as much as four or even five hours on a rare occasion. Uh, it involves counting how many leaves there are, and uh, often these leaves are numbered in pencil, and often the numbering is incorrect. But we have to make sure that when we have 271 images on the, of the recto or the right side, that we have 271 images on the left side or the verso. If we're off by, by one or two, then we either took duplicates on one side or we skipped on the other. And to try to go back and find where that happened is a real mess. So we go through and we number it, and if there's numbering on the pages already, 
uh, when it gets off, we list this on the document to say it says it's 67, but it's really 69, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, sometimes we'll get manuscripts that are not numbered, and we put in a slip of paper every 10 leaves so we know uh, where the count is supposed to be. We not only uh, uh, check on the numbers of the pages, we measure them in terms of uh, centimeters, and we photograph the entire thing, a complete archival copy, including all six sides on the outside, and every page with all four edges every single time. We count a page to be a page if it has at least one half of one letter on it. And that's why our count is often off from what uh, uh, these manuscripts say. And sometimes we found some manuscripts, literally a manuscript fragment that might be one and a half, two letters wide down the strip. We found one of these in Munster, where they have, uh, you know, that's the granddaddy of all text critical institutes, and we, we actually found three manuscripts in Munster among the 22 manuscripts that they owned. So we're convinced that there's more manuscripts that need to be discovered to fill in the gaps and that will be discovered because 20% of what we're shooting are manuscripts that we're actually discovering. In our first 10 years of existence, we've discovered 75 New Testament manuscripts, including several that are from the first millennium and over 20,000 pages of text. So it's not always these little tiny fragments. I'm convinced that there's over a thousand manuscripts left to be discovered in the world, Greek New Testament manuscripts. What I think these will be is especially in Eastern European countries and in the Middle East. I think there will probably also be some manuscripts in China and India that do not claim to have any manuscripts. But there was a relationship between Rome and China beginning in the second century AD. Christianity invaded China early on, same with India. Why would they not have manuscripts there? There was a Buddhist monastery just a few years ago that uh, someone had discovered Greco-Roman literature in this Buddhist monastery. No Christian manuscripts, but Greco-Roman literature. So the contacts are there, the manuscripts of some sort are there, and we are hoping to find others. How do we find out about these manuscripts? Well, we have friends on the ground who will look for us. There was a professor in Romania who said, I want you to come and photograph all the Greek New Testament manuscripts in Romania. So for the next two years, he went around the entire country to library after library and monastery after monastery to find out if they had manuscripts. And then he wrote up uh, uh, request letters for us, all in Romanian, and then we got contracts and began to photograph. We have this happen uh, all over the world and we need some more folks to do it. So if there's some manuscripts in Virginia that uh, we don't know about, we'd love for you to uh, talk to the librarians and we'll have you be the translator to get it so they can understand what we're saying. Well, I've already talked to you a little bit about the Bibliotheca Medici Lorenziana. We went to the East Coast last summer to New York City. We photographed the only manuscripts, Greek New Testament manuscripts in a public library in America, at the New York Public Library. In Greece, they're in many public libraries. In fact, you'll find Greek New Testament manuscripts in high schools in Greece. It's just uh, an incredibly different kind of thing, but they actually open up the New York Public Library for us an hour and a half before the public was allowed to come in so we could photograph these manuscripts. That was a pretty special feeling. And uh, we shot manuscripts in New Jersey and Connecticut as well. And we went to Athens in central Greece and photographed manuscripts and discovered some as well on that trip. Coming up is the trip to an Eastern European country. And I can't tell you in public what that country is, but I can tell you that we've been working on this for a long, long time, and uh, they have reportedly scores of New Testament manuscripts that are not known to any scholars in the West. We've gotten three reports of that so far, and we are hoping to work things out so we can go there pretty soon and photograph their manuscripts, as well as the ones that are known, and it's a well-known library. We also are going to a Middle East monastery pretty soon to examine and photograph their manuscripts, other places. Basically, we're mapping out all of the sites in the world. There's over 253 different places in the world that have manuscripts. So we've been in Australia and New Zealand and uh, Eastern Europe and the Middle East and Western Europe, uh, America, uh, even in Michigan. Well, the cost of expeditions, it's about $10,000 a week for a team of four people because we're bringing a lot of very expensive equipment. And this is one reason why I don't say ahead of time where we're going next. Because if I said, you know, we're gonna be in, in this city and we're gonna be landing on 
June the 3rd, flying into this airport, there's going to be somebody waiting for us just to take our luggage, about $75,000 worth of equipment in the luggage. So we prefer not to mention where we'll be going next. And also the neg negotiations tend to be a little bit delicate, and it's best not to even advertise that until after we've gone. It costs us now, with the Graz uh, Travelers Conservation Copy Stand, $4 to digitize one page of a manuscript. And we go through a triple checking process after we're done photographing, besides all the preparation that goes in ahead of time to get the manuscripts ready to photograph, to make sure that we have got it, that it's in focus, that we've got all four edges, we've got it in sequence, and all the images are properly labeled. This Eastern European trip is going to cost us about $150,000. We'll spread it out over two years. We go to Greece every year. The next trip will be about $30,000. And to this Middle Eastern side, about $40,000 this year. So uh, if you're interested, uh, we could use your money. <laughs> I'll just be blunt. We, really, we do need uh, funding for, for our projects. I'm going to show you some icons at the end of this message of, uh, that are in manuscripts that we've discovered. Here's Matthew. And almost always the icon is on the verso, looking at the recto, looking at the very beginning of the manuscript. I've seen uh, one or two where, where the evangelist is actually on the recto, but here's Mark, probably because Matthew was the tax collector and he just told him how much he owed, but uh, he's, he's, he's weeping here. Uh, and then we have Luke, and finally John. John's icons are almost always the same. He's old. He has an oblong face and kind of a round spot on the top of his forehead with a little tuft of hair there. John the theologian. This is a very rare kind of an icon where it fills up half a page and it's Jesus teaching the 12 disciples. Normally the icons fill up a whole page. The background there is actually gold ink that they figured out a way to use real gold to give it as, as kind of the background for this. And here's the most impressive icon we've ever seen. This is in a 10th century manuscript. It's a lectionary that we photographed in Florence a year and a half ago. And here we have uh, an Orthodox bishop coming to the Pope and asking for some help. This icon is not from the 10th century. It's really from the 15th century. And the uh, Orthodox bishop is giving this particular manuscript to the Pope and saying, we want some help. Uh, apparently to fight off those people who were coming to Constantinople because that's what you see in the lower pane uh, when they got invaded in 1453 and after they laid siege to the city, after the Turks laid siege for uh, 11 months, finally the scribes fled into Western Europe and they brought with them the Greek manuscripts and the Reformation was born and the Renaissance got a huge shot in the arm because of it. But uh, here they actually were ho hoping for some help from the West. Very, very rare to find an icon like that. Well, you can keep up with CSNTM. We have now got almost 50 clips on iTunes U. We were invited to be part of iTunes U by the uh, vice president of Apple who's in charge of education. Normally, you couldn't get on there unless you were a four-year institute, but he invited us. He wanted us to be a part of it. So we should have 50 uh, clips up in, in just a few days, I think. Uh, if you want to get our monthly e-news e newsletter, you can write to info at csntm.org. It's a, an e-newsletter. It comes out uh, the, hopefully at the beginning of the month or pretty close to it. And usually we have a picture of something going on. We will tell you a little bit about the places we're going to, but especially about the places that we've been, because that's when we can start talking about them. And I finally leave you with this image, which I call the Grateful Dead. These are the skulls of former residents at the one of the monasteries of Matera, uh, which is a metamorphosis. And it's the great monastery in Matera in central Greece. These monasteries are on sandstone pillars that rise up from the valley below as much as 1,000 feet. And for centuries, the only way you could get up to the top was to be cranked up in a, in a net. On the little uh, stand there on the right is a, a red egg an Easter egg. And what this represents is these monks' belief that after death there is hope, there is an answer, there is an until, there is resurrection. 
And so they lived their lives in such a way as to reflect on the certainty of uh, the eschatological hope that they have. And that is certainly something that all of us uh, should share with them in common. Thank you very much.